the Lord gave to the church ministries and kind of dig into that and what are they for and how do they work and what do they mean to us as a believer we have gotten messed up about apostles why because we've turned it into a title instead of a ministry do you know that there's only one place in scripture entire thing 66 books one place in scripture where apostle is used as a title So as you've heard already, we're going to be starting a new series on what's called the five-fold ministries. And some of you know what that is right now, and some of you don't know what that is, and that's okay. Be sure to be here for five weeks because you're going to want to hear the entire thing. And for some of you who are here, your radar's already up a little bit, wondering if this is one of those NAR churches. Ah, so... NAR churches. All right, so what's NAR church? The New Apostolic Reformation. If you know what that is, I want you to look at me directly and hear me out. I do not teach that. I do not teach that. If you don't have a clue what that is, don't worry about it because we don't teach it here. All right? All right, let's move on. I want to talk about this place in Ephesians and Corinthians where it says that the Lord gave to the church ministries and kind of dig into that and what are they for and how do they work and what do they mean to us as a believer. So let's start with Ephesians 4, 11. And he, in this case Christ, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, and some as teachers. You notice five five ministries that were given to the church. So we're going to cover these five ministries and what they are and how they affect the church. We'll cover all five, but today we're going to start with that first one, the ministry of the apostle. But for you to understand even why we're talking about these five ministries, you have to keep reading in this same verse. Let's go to verse 12. Here is why we have these five ministries. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith. That's going to be important later. And to the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, if that didn't scare you, it should. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves, carrying about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the crafty and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now, how many of you felt like that was 73 things in a run-on sentence? That's kind of how I feel like when I read that. It's so much, and literally, I could probably do six months on just that set of scriptures and what it means, because there's a whole bunch in there. But that's what he's saying we're supposed to get Two. One day, that's the goal of what we're supposed to get to. Long, a lot of accomplishments, but guess what? He just said, I gave you these five ministries to help you accomplish that. Buckle up. So some would say when we begin this conversation about apostles, oh, there are no apostles today. You can't have apostles today because there was a criteria that apostles had to meet that nobody can meet today, so there's no such thing as an apostle today. Well, we're going to look at that in Scripture, so let's start with that criteria and where it was laid out. It was in Acts 
chapter 1, verse 21. Now, here's what's happening in Acts chapter 1. Christ has been crucified. Christ has risen from the grave. Christ has come and met with the disciples. He spent 40 days with those disciples. He said, now I want you to wait in Jerusalem until what the Father promised would come upon you, which is the baptism in the Spirit. And by the way, I'm now going to ascend to heaven. So he leaves. So now they're waiting in Jerusalem, and they, and they look around, and they say, wait a minute. We lost a guy. There was a guy named Judas the son of perdition, the Bible calls him, who betrayed Christ for the purpose of the crucifixion, and he is no longer with us. As a matter of fact, he has killed himself. And so now we have 11 instead of 12. We need to replace Judas. So that I come up with a criteria for how do we choose who should we replace Judas with? Verse 21, therefore it's necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out and came in among us, beginning with the baptism of John, John baptizing Jesus, until the day that he was taken from us, Jesus ascended, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection." So they put forth two men called Bersabbas, who was called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, should show us which one of these two you have chosen to occupy the ministry. I'm sorry. Let me read that again. To occupy this ministry. Everybody say ministry. To occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. So here is the criteria that the 11 said, this is what we need in the replacement for Judas. We need someone who has been with Jesus while he came and go on this earth from the point of the baptism until his resurrection and the ascension that just happened. So there it is. That's how they decided to replace Judas as an apostle, so therefore, nobody today can meet those requirements. None of us were with Jesus at his baptism with John. None of us were here when Jesus resurrected. We weren't, so therefore, you cannot have apostles today. They cannot exist because nobody can meet that requirement. Right? I got, I got a problem with that when I continue to read the Bible. When I continue to read the Bible, there's a man who is clearly called out as an apostle who does not meet those criteria. His name is Paul. Paul the apostle, referred to as an apostle many times in the scripture, he did not accompany Jesus while he was on this earth from his baptism to his resurrection and ascension. Uh, But Paul even makes an argument that he is an apostle in Galatians 1 and 2. He says, I was taught by the revelation of Jesus and I perform the duties and actions of an apostle. And then when he makes an argument for it in 2 Corinthians 12, 11 and 12, and in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I do the things that apostles do. I operate in miracles, signs, and wonders. Therefore, he calls himself an apostle, and the rest of the group calls him an apostle. But the truth is, he didn't meet the original requirements. Now we got a hole in that thing. And by the way, There's another guy in the Bible who did not meet these requirements and yet was still an apostle called out by scripture as an apostle. His name was Barnabas in Acts 14, 14, not part of the original 12. Oh, wait, there was another guy in scripture who was also called out as an apostle, but he doesn't meet the requirements of the original 12. And his name was Silas, but he was called out as an apostle. So could it be that what we read in Acts chapter 1 was that the apostles were looking for the purpose of replacing Judas with an apostle who had the same experiences they had. 
so they could feel good that all of us learn this together, we're taught this together, let's put a team of 12 back together and let's go. But it wasn't a requirement that from now on there could not be. So could there be apostles today? There's a couple different arguments besides that qualification issue that people make in scripture that I want to show you. The first one is people say, no, you can't have apostles today because of what 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. Now, before I read this scripture, I want to give you some context. This scripture is written to a church body. It is the church body in Corinth. It's a letter written to the Corinthians. We know it as 1 Corinthians. Verse 27 of 12 says, now you are Christ's body. Everybody say Christ's body. body. Got to be important later. You are Christ's body and individually you're members of it. And God has appointed in the church, watch this, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, and various kinds of tongues. So people will take this scripture and they'll argue, see, there's the proof that God appointed first, back in the first century, back at the beginning of the church, he appointed apostles, and those were the only apostles because they were the ones that are appointed first, and and that means that the 12 apostles started the church And I'm listening to this argument, and this is what's going through my head. That would mean that Christ gave us apostles first to start the church, but then after those 12 apostles, he would then give us prophets. Let me ask you something in the New Testament. Who are the prophets that came after the apostles? But that was second. He gave second prophets. And by the way, after those prophets, he gave teachers. Who are the teachers that came third? So in other words, if you're going to say that first means those 12 who were first here, then we got to say next should be a group of prophets because he gave the prophets second. But I don't see prophets listed out like I do the original 12. And by the way, if that were true, when I read this list that says first apostles, second prophet, third teachers, then miracles, it would mean that miracles cannot happen until after the prophets and the teachers were given because they were after the prophets and the teachers. But if I read my Bible correctly, it says the apostles were performing miracles. So how could they perform miracles if there had to be prophets and then teachers before there could be miracles? Is this making sense? Some of you are like, where is he going? (laughs) There could be no healing, no helps, no administration, no tongues until after miracles were given. I don't see this process laid out chronologically like that in scripture. So if it's not a chronological mention, first, second, third, and then, and then, and then, if that's not chronological, what could he mean by first, second, third, and then? I think there's only two options to even discuss to determine what he's trying to say. One, could it be that he's talking about the Corinthian church and how the process of them getting started as a church occurred that God first gave Corinth an apostle? Or could it mean that that's actually laying out an authority structure? In other words, the apostles are first, man, they're on top. And then the prophets, well, they're second. They come after apostles in authority. And then the teachers would be the third in line of authority. And then miracles would be the next line. If you take the authority sequence stance, it would mean that people who work in miracles are in higher authority than people who work in helps. Are you with me? Because miracles came before helps in the authority structure. It would mean that teachers are a higher rank in authority than those who would work in miracles, our administration, our tongues. So those who have teacher are in authority over those who speak in tongues. In other words, like the chronological debate of this is a chronological sequence, if you're going to use the authority of sequence, you have to use it all the way through the list. And you have to say the first people were in higher authority. And then the question is, where in scripture does it ever say a person who speaks in tongues is lower in authority than a prophet or a teacher? 
I don't see the authority conversation coming up in Scripture. So he can't be talking about an authority-ranked structure. That doesn't make sense because we don't see anywhere else a level of authority given to all of that list of things. But here's what I do think makes sense in this Scripture in Corinthians. That they are ministries in a series given to the church body at Corinth. Do you remember Paul started the conversation by saying, you are Christ's body and God gave first. What does he mean by that? Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and saying, you're a body of Christ. And as an apostle, I came to Corinth and I started a church. I started the church of Corinth on a missionary journey. And then there's a prophetic voice that has to come into play when you're in a church. Now, maybe I can make this a little clearer by asking how many of you have been to another church besides Revive? Oh, we're making a list. (laughs) All of us have. I would venture to say everybody in the room has been to another church beside. Have you noticed that other churches have different focuses, different missions, different things they're going after? Man, some are just, man, we are all in to feed the hungry in our territory. Some are, man, we are a missions church. We send people around. Some, we are a training church. We do the, so every church has a vision given to it by God. When we started Revive Church, this is what the Lord said to me, I want a church that puts the word of God and the spirit of God back together. And I want it to be a house where anyone can encounter God. That's the vision. That's the mission. That is a prophetic word we got for who we are in revive church. So after that, there has to be teachers next. Now, listen to me. It doesn't take long to figure out when you're talking about teacher, he may be talking about the ministry of a teacher, or he may be talking about those who teach. Evangelists teach. Pastors teach. Teachers teach. And that would make sense to me that the next thing that happen is you have an apostle come and say, we're going to start a church here. We get a prophetic word for what we're going to do with that congregation. And then the evangelists go out and they lead people to Christ. And when they lead people to Christ, somebody's got to pastor those people. Somebody's got to help them. And once we get them in a condition where they feel good at being in this place, then we got to have some teaching. We got to disciple those people. We got to raise them up. So the evangelism, teaching, and pastoring begin to work with the people. Now look, Go back to the list in a sequence. When you teach people, when you pastor people, what begins to happen? Through that discipleship, they understand the giftings. They understand, wow, we can speak in tongues. Wow, healing is available today. And so those things later in the list are the next obvious sequence of things to happen in that church. Let me me try to clarify what I'm saying. Watch how these two go together. If you look at 1 Corinthians and Ephesians 4, in Ephesians 4, it just says, here are the five ministries given to the church. In Corinthians, it says there's a bit of an order to how they were given in a church. So how does that go together? Apostles first. What do apostles do? I'll talk about it later, but they initiate, they lead, they develop, they start churches. Do you know what the word apostle actually means? The word apostle actually means one sent forth with orders. One sent forth with orders. So by definition, they are the ones who are sent out with an order to do something. Next, prophets. Giving God's word for the church body are the territory. I'm absolutely good that every church has a different function, a different mission, a different goal. Why? Because we're all put in this territory to accomplish different things. But we get those words prophetically. Then you have the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Evangelists, they work in miracles and signs and gifts and healings, which was next in Corinthians. Pastors, they work in helps and administration, care for people, which is next in the list in Corinthians, teachers who disciple on doctrines, ministry, and gifting. So that sequence then begins to make sense when you look at the initiation of a church body. That's my view. But today we're talking about apostles. I've finally gotten to my subject for today. See, I think something has happened in the church with apostles that have messed us up 
as a church, and I'm not talking about revive, I'm talking about as a church as a whole, in the kingdom of God, we have gotten messed up about apostles. Why? Because we've turned it into a title instead of a ministry. We've turned it into a title instead of a ministry. Let me explain. If I were to ask you the question, what is a teacher? What is a teacher? You would say, well, there's somebody that takes the information that we don't understand and they present it to us in a way that makes sense that we could learn from it. We gain in knowledge because they taught us something. We don't say a teacher is a teacher. We say, what does the teacher do? If you look at someone who is evangelist, what is an evangelist? Well, that's someone who shares the gospel. Their goal is to lead people to Christ. They often have the opportunity to work in miracle signs and wonders as a confirmation of the word. And so this is what they do. In other words, when we look at the title of teacher and evangelist, we don't think title. We think, what do they do? What is their ministry? What is their purpose? So let's apply that to the other names. What is a pastor? Some of the things that, that I won't go big on today, uh, but we've used this term pastor because they are a shepherd. They're an overseer. They care for people. And so we've given that title to whoever's running the church. But that doesn't mean the person who's running your church is a pastor because a pastor is one who cares for people. They have a divine endowment by God to especially want to reach out to people, to seek relationship, to make sure you're okay. Are you with me? It's not, I'm a pastor because it's a title given to me here, but there are people in this room who are better pastors than I am because God has given them that desire to really get to know people and to be in their lives. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Next, what is a prophet? A prophet is someone who is getting a divine word to be delivered. That's just it in a basic nutshell. God is saying, I'm going to use you, and I'm going to give you these words, and I want you to deliver them for me. They could be words of encouragement. They could be prophetic words about the future. But we talk about what they do. So what is an apostle? Is it a title in the church? Or is an apostle someone sent out with a mission to build the kingdom of God? That's what they do. And we have to start looking at what they do instead of looking at the title they were given. When you look at the five things listed in 1 Corinthians, um, they are ministries that Christ gave to the church. They are not titles and positions given to the church. Do you remember back that when we just read this, when they were selecting Matthias, they said, we need to select someone to occupy this ministry. They were even saying, this is a ministry. This is not a title we're trying to give Matthias. It's a ministry we want him to function in. So they picked him and said, this is the guy to occupy this ministry. But today's charismatic world, no offense, we get crazy on titles. We get a little weird sometimes. And I'm not trying to offend anybody in the room, but I know an individual who titles himself senior chief apostle. And I'm just wondering, what is that? And who can give you that title? Who decides that you're not only apostle, but you're a senior apostle. And then of the senior apostles, you're the chief of the senior, a pop. It gets weird. Do you know that in Scripture, never, everybody say never, never does any of the apostles identified in the New Testament go by the title of apostle? They may claim they are apostles, but they don't step into a city and say, I, Apostle John, have a word for you today. Do you know that there's only one place in Scripture, entire thing, 66 books, one place in Scripture where apostle is used as a title? What do I mean? I mean, capital A, somebody was identified in the title of apostle. That happens to be... In Hebrews 3, chapter 1, this is what it says. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle. 
and high priest of our... Jesus is the only one who took apostle as a title. No one on earth has apostle as a title. It's a ministry. And by the way, just so we can confirm, we talked about what the definition of apostle was, is one who is sent out with orders. What did Jesus do? He was sent out from heaven to come to this earth with orders to redeem man back to God. He is the apostle. So Christ gave the church, hear me out, new phrase, we're going to be using this one, the apostolic ministry. There is an apostolic ministry. There is a prophetic ministry. There is a teaching ministry. There is an evangelist ministry. There is a pastoral ministry. How do I know that? How can I stand confidently and say that scripture? I'm going to go back to Ephesians 4. And he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. As I said before, here's why they're given. To equip the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, and as a result are no longer children on and on and on and on. What am I saying? These ministries had a job. He said, this is what the ministries will do. Uh, They will equip the saints. By giving you a title? No, by letting you operate in the ministry. They're going to build up the body of Christ. How? By giving us all titles so we feel built up? No, by operating in their ministry. Do we have the unity of faith? How? Through the working of that ministry. Uh, To the mature and no longer would we be children. I'm not a child anymore because now I have an adult title. No, there's a ministry that is building me up to make me mature so that I could speak the truth in love, so that I could grow up and not get a title, but grow up and become mature. So here's the million dollar question. Do we still have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers today? I'm going to ask you another question posed by this same scripture. Do we have in the church at large, even in this body, do we have a unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God? Are we a mature man to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ? That's why I said earlier, this statement should scare you. I don't think I'm mature to the fullness of Jesus Christ. I got a long way to go. I love the sanctification process. I'm not there yet, but why am I bringing that out? Because if we do not have a unity of the faith, a knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, then we still need these ministries because that's why the ministries were given to us so that we could attain that, but we haven't attained it yet. So we must still need these ministries. Secondly, let me ask you a question. You you said earlier you have been to other churches. When you went to other churches, did those other churches have teachers? Yes. Did those other other churches have pastors? Did those other churches have evangelists? Well, if those other churches still have those three, why did they kick the other two out? Where do you read in scripture that I gave you these five things, but eventually you'll only need three? At some point, I'm going to get rid of these two. He's telling the church at Corinth, after Christ is resurrected, after the work of the first 12 is already run, that I'm giving you the apostolic ministry. Nowhere does he say three of the five will be good, but two of them will go away. I don't know why we've decided to kick two out when scripture doesn't tell us to kick those two out. And some will say, well, here's the problem. We cannot meet the requirements of the apostle back in Acts, which, okay, I understand where you're coming from on that. I just don't think it's a valid argument. And by the way, we no longer need uh, the prophets because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Now, see, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. In, and when the Holy Spirit came upon a prophet, then a prophet could say what God has. But now we have the Holy Spirit in us. So now we are the prophetic voice. We don't need, okay, fine. You want to make that argument that that's why you don't need an apostle and that's why you do need a prophet. Let's go back to scripture. Doesn't it say in John 14 and in 1 John 2 27 that the Holy Spirit will teach us? Then why do I need teachers? 
I got the Holy Spirit. He's going to teach me. Doesn't scripture say that Jesus is our good shepherd? He's our pastor. Then why do I need a pastor? I've got a good shepherd in Jesus, so I don't need that position at all. Doesn't scripture say in John 6, that God will draw you to salvation, that his kindness leads us to repentance? I don't need an evangelist. God's going to do that. So I don't need any of these fivefold anymore because I've got Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus. We're done. <laughs> I'm hoping I make my point. He said, Christ gave these to the church because we need them until we're mature. And we are not mature yet. So let's talk about apostles. What is an apostle in the sense of the apostolic ministry? Are you, by chance, apostolic? Do you know if Christ gave this ministry to you for the building up and the maturity of the church? Are you operating in the ministry of the apostolic? By definition, the apostle starts ministries. He is sent out with orders. He builds, he organizes, he administrates, he solves the ongoing problems. They're looking to establish the kingdom of God on earth. They are kingdom growth leaders. They want systems. They want leaders. They want delegation put in place for the maturing of the church. They are looking to develop and activate other people. They are catalyst for church starts and improvements. They settle doctrinal disputes. I'll show you that in a minute. They set things, gifts, ministries, and people in motion for the future of the maturity of the church. Apostolic people are structure and, wow, that was a whistle, structure and organizationally minded. Structural and organizationally minded. And yet there are four other ministries. So let's talk about what it means to be apostolic and what it means to be in those four other ministries when something happens in the life of someone in the church. Let's, let's say for my example purposes today that in your life, in the circle of family or friends or people you have around you, someone close to you dies. How do these ministries come into play for you? Where do we go from there when that happens? The pastors come to the forefront. They know you're hurting. They want to be there with you. They want to find out what your needs are. They want to minister to you because they know you're in a place of maybe confusion or hurt or loss. Everything in them says, I need to know if you're okay and how can I help you be okay through this tragedy? That's a pastor. What does an evangelist do? An evangelist wants to come and say, look, I know you just lost somebody, but do you know Jesus? Because one day this can happen to you, and I don't want you, I don't want your friends to be sitting around wondering, did you go to an eternity with God or not? So I want to share the gospel with you. What does uh, the prophet do? Prophets, we're going to talk about them next week. Prophets want to know, were we living a holy life? Were we listening to God? Were we repentant about our sin? And so they may come to you and say, look, look, I, I look at what we saw in this person's life. Were they, were they walking in a holy way? And what can we learn from them about you so that you can walk in holiness? What does the teacher do? The teacher wants to come and explain to you what does the scripture say about death? What happens? Where do we go from here? To be absent from here is to be present with the Lord. What does that mean in the lifespan? What does the Bible say? How are we taken care of? How does that transition work? What do we do? So you have a teacher that's involved. Now let me tell you what the apostle does when someone close to you dies. The apostle wants to make sure you have someone to come and pastor you. The apostle wants to make sure that someone is there to share the gospel with your family. The apostle wants to make there's a, someone there to give you a life lesson out of this about living holy. The apostle wants to make sure that someone is there to explain to you, what does that scripture mean when it says this and these people don't enter the kingdom of God and these people do and what does that mean for my relative? They're going to explain that. They're going to teach it. The apostolic person knows they are not the best person to be there for you in that moment. Uh-oh. 
They want to make sure you're okay and that someone is there to share the gospel with you and to find out you're living a holy life and what you've learned from the Spirit and explain what the Word of God, but they recognize it's not me. There's somebody God is equipped better to do those things than me, but my job is to make sure those people are available for you when you need those people. Apostolic person knows that if there's not somebody available to meet your needs, then as an apostolic person, we haven't done our job. Are you with me? In other words, as an apostolic person, I didn't set things in place for you. I don't have anybody to go care for you. I don't have anybody to teach you and to answer the questions that you're going to have. That was my job to set up the organization to make sure that you were taken care of. So let's go to scripture and let's confirm some of the roles of an apostolic ministry. In other words, let's look at what the apostles did and say, does this connect with you? Would you be thinking that way? Would you do that kind of thing? Uh, There's actually a definition that Jesus gives in Mark 3, 14 of, of what an apostle is. It says, he, Jesus, appointed the 12 so that they would be with him and they could be sent out. They could be sent out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. They have authority, and they're sent out to preach. And some of you may be thinking, well, what's the difference in preaching and teaching? Is the apostle a teacher, or is he a preacher? Here, Jesus said, I sent them out to preach. What's the difference in preaching and teaching? Teaching is when I'm exposing knowledge to you. I'm trying to get your understanding level up. I'm trying to let you see what that scripture says, how it applies to your life, what to do with it. When I'm preaching, I'm trying to get you to apply that to your life. I'm trying to motivate you to do these things. I'm trying to get you to step forward and accept Christ. I'm trying to get you to step forward and start a Bible study at your workplace. I'm preaching to you. I'm trying to motivate you to do things. In Acts 14, 23, Paul is an apostle. He's in a city called Derby, and the apostles appointed elders, appointed elders, Acts 4, 23. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. What did the apostles do? They said, I've got to leave Corinth. I've got to leave Ephesus, but I can't left it without an overseer group. So I'm going to appoint some overseers to look over this ministry while I'm gone. They appoint elders. In Jerusalem, Peter, the apostle, confirmed the word of God. Acts 2.14, but Peter, taking a stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to the men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give heed to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But this was what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And he goes on to explain to them what was spoken through the prophet Joel. I'm confirming for you today that Joel said there would be a day when I pour out my spirit and and you would prophesy and and your children would uh, have visions and your old men would dream dreams. He's confirmed. That's now. That's the day. He's telling them in in Jerusalem, I'm confirming for you what the Bible says. And then they they settle doctrinal decisions. What do I mean by that? So we have this case where Jesus was sent for the Jewish nation, and and he is there for them. But then all of a sudden, Peter uh, goes to meet with Cornelius, and Cornelius is a Roman. He's a Gentile, and he gets saved, and he starts speaking in tongues. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now the Gentiles get to come to know Christ as Savior. What are we going to do about that? So they go back to Jerusalem, and they meet with James, the brother of Jesus, who happens to be an apostle. And they say, how do we handle this? This is new. What do we do with it? This is what James says. Therefore, it's my judgment that we don't travel. My judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles but that we write them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. What did he just say? Here's some of the things the Gentiles are doing. We need to tell them to stop doing it, but go to the synagogues because in the synagogues, they're going to be taught. He's making decisions on what to do with the church. Paul mentored, Paul the apostle mentored Timothy, listen to this mentoring statement in 2 Timothy 1, 6-7. For this reason, 
Paul is talking to Timothy. I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now he's writing a letter. He's not there. He's saying, I was with you. I put my hands on you. There was a gift placed in you. And I want you to kindle that afresh. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but power, love, and discipline. He's saying, Timothy, come on, man. I have poured into you. Let that rise up in you. Don't be timid. Be strong. Be powerful. Operate in love and a sound mind. Mentoring him. If you go on to read Peter and Paul, they started churches in Antioch, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis. If you look at James and Thomas and Matthew, who are apostles, they were starting in different countries of the world, in Indonesia and places that you probably don't even hear about because it's recorded in history. You got apostles like John and Matthew who write gospels of doctrine for us to understand. The apostolic ministry, they are the initiators and mentors given to the church to assist growth, organization, and development of the church into a place of maturity. Let me, let me let you into the mind of a way an apostolic person thinks. So if I, if I go through this and you say, man, that's me. You think like me, or you say, I don't think like that. That's okay. Because you do think like one of the other ministries, and we'll get to that in the coming weeks. But the apostolic ministry thinks like this. What needs to be put in place to develop the people? How are they going to learn? How are they going to grow? Uh, are we covering all the basis we need to for this season in this territory? Are we who we are supposed to be to this territory? Do we have people to train? And do I have people trained up to train people? Will the, where will we be as a church two years from now? Where will we be five years from now? Where will we be 10 years from now? What do we need in the way of resources to fulfill the plans that God has given us? How do we organize this thing for the best results? Uh, and quite honestly, most apostolic people are not relationally based. They're goal and vision based. Where are we going? My job is to help set us up to get there. And that type of thinking is very natural. It's second hand for the apostolic. I'll give you a quick personal story. I didn't go into ministry until I was 40 years old. Before I was in ministry, I was in manufacturing. I was director of operations, plant manager. I made product. But in the business, the headhunters, the people who help you get jobs, they knew me as a turnaround guy. What's a turnaround guy? When a company is struggling, when they're not making enough money, when they're not getting enough product out the door, you hire Todd Mozingo. Why? Because he comes in and he can just see what's wrong. He can see this is laid out wrong. He can see you're getting your product wrong. He can see your quality levels are killing you. And so you go in and it's just easy. I, I could walk in on an interview and a guy would take me out to the manufacturing plant and say, this is not working like it should. What's wrong? And it wouldn't take me very long at all to say, well, that's organized wrong. You're, you're doing a repetitive thing and you're not set up for a repetitive function. Uh, you need Kanban bins so your materials get to your floor quicker. It was easy for me. And what I'm saying is that ministry was given to me before I was brought into the kingdom. It was my training and my practice ground so that when God brought me into the kingdom, those things that were natural to me could be used in the kingdom. Are you with me? I'm telling you, some of you are sitting there and this is you. If this is the way you think, then maybe you should be exploring in prayer before God. Why? Why did you give me this ministry? Why do I think this way? But listen, figuring out that you operate in the apostolic ministry does not mean you are ready to lead. There is training. When he told me I was going into ministry, it was three years later before I actually went into ministry. There are times when you need to be under other apostolic leaders, where you need to understand the church, where you need to understand your own flaws or your lack of need for the other ministries. Those things have got to be brought to your attention. Let me tell you the number one best training ground for the apostle. If you are apostolic, this will be your number one training. Failure. 
Failure will teach you more than anything if you're apostolic because it'll hit you like a ton of bricks and you'll think, what in the world I do wrong? I will not do that wrong again. I need to rearrange and do something differently because I don't like that feeling. And most people that think they're apostolic are actually not. It's okay. Give me five weeks and you'll be okay with that statement. How do you know if you're actually apostolic? Do you know there's one measurement in the Bible that applies to all ministries and all giftings? If you want to know if you operate in that gifting, if you want to know if you operate in that ministry, they're all under one single measurement. It's called fruit. Is there fruit that you are apostolic? What would be the fruit? Is what you build, is it substantial? Is it sustaining? Is it growing? Is it organized? Does it have structure? Is it succeeding? Some people think they're apostolic, but they're not. And this is where things like inner healing and narrow gate come into play. Why do I say that? Because oftentimes the people who think they're apostolic are just people who need control. They need a title. They need authority. They don't know how to grow it, but they want to be put in charge of it. Are you with me? And that's a need inside that you're trying to meet because you don't know you're operating out of that need instead of out of the apostolic ministry. What's the downside if you're apostolic? If that's the ministry that God has given to you, what's the traps? What do you got to watch for? You got to make sure you don't become a dictatorship. You got to make sure that you, it's not a love of being in charge. You got to watch things like pride. Why? Because when you succeed, you want to take credit. But I'm not succeeding because of me. I'm succeeding because what he gave me. So I constantly recognize without him, I cannot succeed. I have to watch attitude. You have to watch the abuse of leadership. You have to watch this. God called me to lead. So y'all should follow me. Listen, if you don't have fruit, why would anybody follow you? There's a lack of humility that can come in the apostolic ministry. But the true apostolic ministry feels a responsibility to steward not only the ministry gift they were given, but the church. It rises, it falls based on the apostolic leadership. So I have to constantly look at myself and say, am I doing what you asked me to do, God? Am I using the gifting that you've given me in order for us to move forward? Or am I a hindrance in some way to what's going on? Final comments and then we're done. The church needs apostolic people. We need as a congregation and we need as a church, as a whole in the nation and in the world, we need apostolic people. They are organization minded. They are growth minded. We need apostolic people who are humble, who recognize this is a gift and I'm meant to steward this gift and I can mess it up. We need apostolic people who care about the kingdom of God. What are we doing in this territory? What are we doing in this nation? Is the church going to rise up in our government? Are we just going to continue to hand it over to the enemy? The church needs apostolic people who know they need the other ministries. You got to know when you're not the best person. You got to know that there are people who are better at pastoring people, who know how to touch their heart, who know how to give them love. You got to know that there are prophetic people who are hearing clearly from God and can strengthen you if you weren't so conceited that you don't want to listen to them. You got to know that there are teachers, people who can roll it out to where you sit and say, wow, I never even saw that. You got to know that they're evangelists. I can share the gospel. I've shared the gospel many times. I've seen many people come to Christ. But I'm sharing, (laughs) you'll love this. I'm sharing a teacher's gospel. What do I mean by that? I'm explaining when I share the gospel what the Bible says about you and salvation. When you meet a true evangelist, they don't need that scripture in that heavy of a form. They need to tell you, God loves you and you are hurting and he wants to come and rescue you right now. Right in this moment, would you be open to what he has for you? 
I did not just say evangelists don't use scripture. And then I think the church needs apostolic people who realize there is a time of training to fully operate in the apostolic ministry. It's not a gift of know all, be all, do all. It is a gift that is developed. It's a ministry that is developed. And the church needs apostolic people who want to be trained by senior chief apostles. <laughs> Listen, one of the shortcomings of an apostolic person is, well, if God gave me this gift, then I should know what I'm doing. So let me just get in and do it. And then you find out your arrogance and your pride just got in the way of the ministry that he gave you because he gave you a mentor like Paul was given to Timothy to raise Timothy up so that Paul could leave and Timothy could do it on his own. But there was a time of training. Stand to your feet, please. I'll ask my altar ministers to come forward. What are we doing in this set of messages? We are looking at why did the Lord give to the church these five ministries. What was his purpose? What was his goal? He states it very, very succinctly and clearly to grow us up, to give us unity, to make us mature so that we could attain the fullness of Christ. If we don't have five ministries operating fully, then we don't know unity and maturity and the fullness of Christ. We know part of it. We know some of it. We don't fully grow. So we've got to identify who's operating in what ministries so that we can come mature and complete. So I'm asking you, if what I have said today about the apostolic ministry, man, just pings on your heart. Like, he's talking my game. He's talking me. This is, what, this is how I think. And I'm tired of everybody else telling me that I'm not personal enough or I don't care enough because this is the way I think. Because you think apostolically instead of pastorally doesn't make you bad or wrong. It makes you operating in a different ministry. I need to know who you are if you're apostolic. We need to start talking and developing plans and where we're going and what can work in this territory and how we grow up and how we plan and how we organize for success. But maybe you're pastoral, maybe you're evangelistic, maybe you're prophetic, maybe you're a teacher. Guess what? We need you every bit as the apostolic. Apostolic can't start a thing without the other ministries. It's got to be together. It's got to be together so we're whole and complete. So this is what I'm asking you this morning. Right here is a group of altar ministers. If you believe that this hit you today, that I think I might be apostolic, I want you to come and pray with one of these. It's not an impartation for the ministry. You believe you've already got it. But let's pray that God would speak to you clearly. They would knock things like pride out of the way and let us just see what he really wants to do with us. Maybe you just need somebody to confirm with you. Now, if you're here today and you've got an illness, you're here today and you've got a relationship problem, you've got a financial problem, you've got a pain going on that you need prayer for, they're going to pray with you. We're not excluding you at all. But I am looking for those people who can begin searching with God. Did you make me apostolic for the purposes of the kingdom of God? And is this the place where I can be trained up to operate in the apostolic ministry? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we're here because you wanted us here. You picked us at this time in this territory to be a body of Christ. And therefore, you have equipped us with these ministries and giftings in order to operate in the fullness of what you have for it. Open our eyes to who you made us to be so we can operate fully and maturely in this territory. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.